I'll just give it another few minutes for everyone to join. Okay, should we get started? So um, I'd like to welcome you to the second session of our Rocky Worlds discussion meetings. Um, hopefully you all enjoyed our lovely talk last time from Anat Shara. Um, and this time we've got Simon Nock, who's going to give us a great talk. So just to kind of go through some of the formalities for today. Um, okay, should we get started? So, um, I'd like to welcome you to the second session. Can you hear discussion meetings? Um, um, so we're going to have 30 minutes talk from Simon, followed by 10 minutes of plenum discussion, where we open up the floor for questions, but also a bit of general discussion. And then we're going to finish up with 10 minutes where we will all go into breakout rooms and we'll be able to discuss slightly more informally with our colleagues. So we're going to have 30 minutes talk from Simon. So I'm going to stop with that. I'm going to stop sharing my screen now and um, give a big welcome to Simon Lock. Um, Hello everyone. Um, cool. Can everyone see my screen? Yep, all good. Fantastic. Uh, so uh, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us. Uh, today I'm going to talk a little bit about the origin of volatiles and sort of set the scene for uh, where we at, where we are at. Um, uh, looking at the role that impacts play in particularly uh, sort of blowing off uh, atmospheres from uh, various uh, terrestrial planets. And so the reason this is sort of interesting is this is really a huge variety of atmospheres that we observe, not only in our solar system, we have, you know, three uh, terrestrial bodies all have three completely different atmospheres, uh, different masses, um, uh, different compositions. Um, and also, as we increasingly get a better idea, better constraints on the mass and radius of exoplanets, looking at sort of a compilation here that um, I took from Carlton et al, but the data is from exoplanet.eu, looking at the uh, planetary mass on the x-axis versus the planetary radius, of sort of our best constrained um, uh, exoplanets to date. And for reference, the curves, these lines are the mass radius relations for bodies of different uh, compositions. So here you have 100% iron, 100% rock, 100% water, 100% hydrogen, which are all sort of idealistic end members. But this is to show that even for planets of the same mass, we have a whole range of different compositions. And, and part of that is changes in things like the size of their mantles relative to their cores, but also in terms of the atmospheres is that they have. And so we really want to understand how uh, planets acquire their atmospheres and uh, how they change through accretion um, and uh, both in terms of their mass and composition, because really at the end of the day, the atmosphere is what is setting a lot of the properties of the planet. It is controlling the internal evolution. It's controlling uh, the habitability of those planets um, and you know, their overall fate as a, as a planetary body. And one of the processes that I'm really interested in uh, is looking at the role that impacts and particularly 
large impacts between planet-sized bodies, known as giant impacts, play in the sort of prop in setting the properties uh, of those atmospheres. And the reason that that these are sort of so interesting is that. Uh, partly they're just really cool events, um, and I'll show you a video of them, uh, of one of them uh, later on to, to reinforce that. But also they are pretty ubiquitous uh, throughout models uh, and our, uh, of planet formation, our understanding uh, of, of theory, and now also really awesomely, we've now actually observed the aftermath of, of collisions in terms of the debris, extreme debris disks around uh, other stars. Um, and so really, we think that planets form by collisions of various different sizes. So you start off with a, a disk of gas and dust. That disk sort of, uh, uh, that dust sort of sticks together into dust bunnies, which collects together into asteroids, or so a process that I will, you know, say right now we don't fully understand, although there's some very good um, ideas out there. And then those asteroids, the largest of them grow, accumulating other small asteroids and more dust and, and sort of pebble-sized objects and grow to the size of planets. And the final stage of planet formation is when those sort of planet-sized bodies start to collide together. And these really are very dramatic events. They are the most extreme events terrestrial planets experience uh, during their formation. For example, an impact that forms an Earth mass body uh, generally uh, releases more energy during the few hours, first few hours of the impact than is released from the surface of the sun. So that's a huge amount of energy. Uh, it vaporizes a large fraction of the rock, uh, some metal uh, from the bodies. Uh, generally the huge torques involved leave them very rapidly, leave plants very rapidly rotating. It can lead to the formation of moons and, and, and all sorts of things. These are very, very dramatic very dramatic events. Um, and coming back to our own solar system, they're particularly important for understanding the Earth's evolution because we think it's one of these giant impacts, the exact properties of which TBD, uh, that uh, actually led to the formation of uh, our, own, our own moon. There was an impact uh, late in, in the Earth's formation, ejected a load of material into orbit out of which the moon uh, accreted. And this is really important because it sort of sets time zero for the Earth's subsequent uh, evolution. It's very sort of a, a very much a defining um, sort of moment in Earth's uh, early, early history. So as I promised, uh, <laughs> just for fun movie time, really, uh, I'm just gonna show you a simulation of what of these uh, impacts look like, just try and get you to have sort of physical sense of the, of the magnitude of these events. Uh, this particular event uh, was visualized for us from one of our uh, actual uh, impact simulations um, by the Adler Planetarium and the Supercomputing uh, Center at the University of Illinois. And what you're going to see is uh, initially very rapidly rotating body here in the center, being uh, which is just over an Earth mass, being hit by something that's about half a Mars mass. The reason the body is so oblate isn't because you've got the aspect ratio of your screen wrong. It's actually in this simulation, it actually starts off very rapidly rotating. And so you end up with sort of almost this flying saucer uh, shape uh, to the planet. So what you're going to see is that this body is going to come in it is gonna hit the proto-Earth and blow off a huge amount of material into orbit. And in reality, you would now be blind. Uh, the amount of energy would, this is uh, radiating at tens uh, of thousands of, uh, of Kelvin. Uh, it's incredibly bright. It, uh, and really you're sort of having like an X-ray view into the center of what's happening. But basically what happens is you're, you're vaporizing a huge amount of material. You're kicking off uh, ejecting material from the system, uh, particularly from the, the thing that hits you from the impact there. Um, and uh, sort of it, the resulting vaporization and the very rapid rotation of this system leads to a very, very expanded um, uh, post impact structure. But what, what we want to know for the purposes of, of um, of our talk today is what that actually does to the to the atmosphere. And 
the reason that we think that planets, that we care about what's happening to an atmosphere in these bodies is because we think that planets, um, particularly at least in our solar system, form with their volatiles. The, the planets are accreting volatile elements, those that would form an atmosphere or an ocean through out accretion. And this is sort of evidence that's coming from uh, arguments of both the total volatile budgets, but also the um, uh, isotopic uh, properties of, uh, of the Earth compared to other bodies in our solar system. And so we expect planets to have volatiles and to have therefore atmospheres for much of their accretion. And also later in accretion, the impact flux onto those planets is low enough that actually they cool sufficiently to have oceans. And so uh, this image on the right um, from um, uh, Simone Marshi, um, which is sort of looking at the early earth would actually probably have been something like most planets would have looked like through much of the late stages of accretion. And so the volatile budgets are there during the time that we have, during this period of, of giant impacts. And we want to understand what actually those impacts are doing to those volatiles within all of the mess of the giant impact. So there have been a really, uh, some really cool work recently uh, led by Jacob Garris and colleagues um, looking at full three-dimensional simulations of giant impacts, including the atmospheres directly. So these sort of simulations require a huge level of uh, really, really high resolution for the simulations. And just to, uh, as an illustration of that, what I'm going to show you uh, are some of their results. Um, and what you're going to see is the sort of the impact simulation cut through the equator. Uh, so you have the two colliding planets, you sort of slice through the equator, throw away the top top half of the mass and just look down uh, on, on the top of the impact. And they explored a, a range of different impacts. This is from the 2020 paper, actually modeling directly what is happening in these impacts. And you get these really beautiful movies because you have a very, very high resolution that can capture uh, a lot of these features and actually directly trace what is happening to that upper layer, that very small, uh, mass layer uh, during these impacts. And so, as I said, they explored a different range of impacts, looking at uh, what uh, actually, how those sort of impact parameters affect the, um, the uh, amount of atmosphere that's lost. And from their simulations, they can actually build up, they did a whole range of simulations, which is a huge computational effort. And they actually build up uh, sort of what, uh, what we typically call scaling laws. And so on the y-axis, you have the fraction of atmosphere lost. Um, and on the x-axis, you have a wonderful combination of the impact parameters that are sort of empirically fitted to try and give you the best relationship between those set of parameters and the, the fraction of atmosphere you lose. And what they find is that you can, uh, the basically, as you'd expect, the faster the impact, the larger the body that's hitting you, uh, the, the more atmosphere uh, you, you tend uh, to lose. However, there are some serious uh, limitations to being able to actually do these three-dimensional simulations. So uh, one is that in order to actually be able to resolve the atmosphere, um, you are sort of limited by your resolution to dealing with atmospheres that are at least thousands of bars. And there's a um, uh, sort of uncertainty whether we can actually uh, uh, resolve that level atmosphere or whether we actually need to go to a gigapascal uh, basal pressure for your atmosphere. So these are really big atmospheres, particularly within the, in the uh, context of our own solar system and within the context of a lot of observed um, uh, exoplanets. These Simulations are also incredibly computation expensive. And so it's hard to run them for different atmospheres, different compositions, and to really explore the effect uh, of uh, the surface conditions. So the presence or absence of an ocean, um, the, the atmospheric composition on the, the effect of loss. And so how do we go about um, doing that? How do we go and explore some of these parameters that we 
uh, can't really access uh, in these sort of three-dimensional simulations without burning through the, you know, the world's com uh, supercomputer time. Um, so to do that, we're just gonna sort of take a step back and think about what processes are driving atmospheric loss during giant impacts. And so this is uh, another cut through, through a simulation. Here, the particles are colored by uh, their, their composition. So here you have in, in silver, there's the metal core, silver or brown, there's the metal cores, red and yellow are the mantles, and this blue um, uh, here is the atmosphere. And the way that you're losing um, uh, atmosphere in these collisions is sort of in two principal processes. First, the uh, atmosphere that's near the impact site is um, caught up in vapor plumes. You have, uh, at these sort of velocities, you are vaporizing a large fraction of material, melting a large fraction of material, and that gets kind of kicked out in these sort of quite rapidly expanding uh, plumes of silicate vapor, um, and that typically drags along um, a lot of, of atmosphere. The second process is more to do with, it is, is a process that's governing loss far from the impact site, so not directly where the two plants are crushing together, um, but actually you have a shock wave from the impact, which uh, if you have, if this is transmitting at good resolution, you might be able to see uh, as this sort of uh, change in color, particularly in the core, it's particularly obvious, that's arcing out from the impact site. And what happens is when that reaches the far side of the planet, it kind of gives the atmosphere, the base of the atmosphere, a little kick. That shock wave transitions from the planet into the atmosphere. And because the atmosphere has quite a steep density gradient, the shock wave accelerates through the atmosphere and kicks the top of it off to escape. And so um, before we could do <laughs> wonderful, fancy three-dimensional uh, simulations of experiments, it was mostly this latter process that was the, the focus of, of uh, studies of atmospheric loss from giant impacts. To actually do, the vapor plumes does require sort of either an approximation or to actually do it in three dimensions. But the ground kick, you can actually try and simplify to uh, a pseudo one dimensional uh, situation. And so there was um, a lot of work done in the 90s. And I'm going to show you a seminal work by Genna in 2003 to try and model this process using one dimensional hydrodynamic codes, which are much less uh, <laughs> difficult to run um, and so able to do on uh, um, sort of or, or basically on your personal computer if you wanted to. And the way that this works is that you model your uh, atmosphere and ocean, if you have one, as basically a stack. You have your atmosphere sitting on top of your ocean, and then the ground motion due to the shock is simulated by giving the ground an initial velocity and then having that shock propagate, propagate through the ocean and atmosphere. And uh, for bodies with uh, no uh, ocean, um, Gendron Abe uh, in 2003 did this, uh, probably the paper I've read most in my life, <laughs> a wonderful uh, sort of uh, examination of uh, the processes that lead to loss in this case. And what they found is that there was um, a nice relation between the ground velocity that they set in their experiments, down here given in kilometers per second, up here given as a fraction of Earth's escape velocity, and this is the fraction of the atmosphere on the y-axis. You can see that for low ground velocities, you get very little loss. And then there is this sort of gradual, almost linear increase in loss uh, with, with ground velocity up to the point that you get to the escape velocity, in which case you're chucking off your ground as well as your atmosphere. <laughs> so you're kind of, uh, kind of lost. Um, and so by looking at this, we can actually sort of take um, a uh, sort of hybrid approach between the three-dimensional and one-dimensional simulations. So we can take the results that you have from these one-dimensional simulations like Genner and Abe and convolve it with uh, the distribution of ground velocities that you find in three-dimensional impacts. So uh, J.K. Gagaris in their 2018 paper looked at this um, and what I'm showing you on the bottom here is for two different impacts. Uh, this on the left is a head-on impact um, where the two bodies are just smashed straight into each other and on the right, a more grazing impact. Um, the top hemisphere 
is the peak ground velocity is a fraction of, a, of escape. Um, and on the bottom is the time at which that uh, happens. So, so for example, the head-on impact, the, this is the direction of the impact. <laughs> and so here you have almost instantly you reach um, peak ground velocity and you reach high ground velocities near the impact site. And then further, away, as you go further and further away from the impact site, you reach lower ground velocities. And then there's a focusing effect of shock waves at the, at the antipode which leads to slightly higher uh, velocities at that point. And then what you can do is by convolving those two, you can calculate what the atmospheric loss fraction you'd expect using the one dimensional simulations over the surface of the planet. And so the top hemisphere of, uh, these are four different impacts. Uh, the top hemisphere is the loss fraction that was observed directly in the three dimensional calculation. And then the bottom is the, um, calculation based on convolving with the one dimensional uh, laws. And what you can see is that in uh, it generally does sort of an okay job at lower ground velocities, uh, lower impact velocities where uh, uh, the ground kick mechanism is not necessarily the principal mechanism for loss. It doesn't do as good a job, but certainly when you get up to higher velocities, it actually does a very good job of matching the, the loss, both in terms of distribution and total that you'd expect. And so uh, uh, this is a plot from the Fieras paper again, looking at the atmospheric mass loss fraction as a function of the impact parameter. So from head on to very grazing for impacts of three different velocities. And the lines here are their direct 3D simulations and the points here are the, that 3D ground velocity distribution convolved with the 1D uh, results. And so, as I said, it doesn't do quite as good a job for, for lower velocities, although it kind of gets the trend. Um, but there's a really, uh, this is really helpful that actually we can use this hybrid approach to, uh, by doing much less computation expensive one dimensional simulations, actually explore the effect of surface conditions on the efficiency of atmospheric loss. And so that's what we did. Um, I should admit this is a project that has taken 10 years because it was the first project I started doing in my uh, graduate school. I then got sidetracked by the moon <laughs> and have come back to it to do it. Uh, and I'm glad I did because I, I actually understand it way more having uh, being sort of, you know, 10 years older, 10 years more experienced. But what we did is we ran uh, 1D simulations for a range of different masses, planets, compositions, pr uh, surface pressures, temperatures, um, and we also explored the effect of the depth of the ocean. And the aim was to try and build a scaling law for 1D simulations to then combine with the 3D impact simulations to actually look at the effect of the surface conditions on the efficiency of loss. And this paper, I very when I first drafted this talk, I very optimistically said submitted. And so I've changed that to almost submitted. <laughs> um, but what we find is, is sort of uh, some quite interesting things. So for um, the case of no ocean, uh, so this is a, a very similar plot to what I showed you before. This is ground velocity as a function of escape velocity um, and the atmospheric loss fraction. This is the result by Ginner and Abe. We explored a whole load of compositions and they all give the same result to, to within <laughs> a range of things. The mass of the body also does not matter. You get a very similar relation between the ground velocity and the atmospheric loss fraction, which would be great, um, except there is a slight uh, issue, uh, which is although the relation between ground velocity and atmospheric loss fraction is quite consistent, the ground velocity actually depends what's on top of you. So you can sort of imagine that when the shockwave gets to the surface, the, if you have something else that's on top of the surface, so if you've got like, you know, a very thin atmosphere, it eh, doesn't care, the shock just pushes it out of the way and it, it, it acts as if almost as if it was releasing into vacuum. But if you've got a much thicker atmosphere, that offers more resistance to the ground and the ground can't reach um, as high uh, a velocity. And just as an illustration of that, this is the ground velocity that you get uh, upon breakout of the shock. Um, as a function of the atmospheric pressure 
for uh, shocks that have a particle velocity. So you can think of that as an indication of the strength of the shock, the particle velocity in the shock of 0.2 times the escape velocity and 0.35 um, uh, times the escape velocity. And so what you see is at very high atmospheric pressures, the velocity of the shock, uh, the particle velocity in the shock is very close to the particle velocity in the ground. And only at uh, lighter atmospheres do you actually end up uh, sort of approaching uh, sort of this limit to where the uh, ground almost pretends like it's uh, going into vacuum. Um, cool. And so this has a, a significant effect on the efficiency of loss between these different atmospheres. So now instead of plotting ground velocity, I'm actually gonna plot the shock particle velocity. And so you can think of this as the thing that doesn't change. If you have a given impact, it is the shock particle velocity that is reaching the surface is going to be the same pretty much regardless of what your atmosphere is. And so what you can see is that the, for a given strength of shock, the atmospheric loss fraction you get can vary quite a bit by tens of percent depending on your atmospheric pressure. And the lower the atmospheric pressure, the more favored loss is. Also, if we just for illustration purposes, isolate the 500 bar case, we can also, uh, we also find that the higher your atmospheric temperature, the more efficient loss uh, is, because you, you more effectively, the ground releases to a higher velocity. And similarly, if you're looking at a lighter composition like hydrogen compared to CO2, loss is also uh, more, more efficient. And so if we look at that all sort of together, you end up with a whole range of uh, impact loss efficiencies, depending on what your atmospheric pressure, composition uh, and temperature is. And those changes can be quite large, particularly around sort of the, the onset of loss. And you can end up with changes that are on the region of, of sort of 50 uh, percent or so. And so this is the difference in loss between a sort of ideal end member uh, sort of maximum loss and the loss we actually uh, calculate in our simulations. So um, another important thing we have to consider is what an ocean does. So if we're looking at later in, uh, impacts later in accretion, like the moon forming impact, we, as long as the oxidation state is correct, we expect the planets to have liquid oceans on their surface. And so again, Gendron Abe got here before us, um, and in a uh, sort of follow-on paper from the 2003 paper, they calculated the uh, loss in 1D simulations, including an ocean. Now, because these are 1D simulations, you can't lose atmosphere until you've lost, sorry, you can't lose ocean until you've lost your whole atmosphere. So here, this bottom axis is um, the fraction of atmosphere loss from zero, to 100%, and then ocean loss from zero to 100%. And each of these lines, each of these colors, are their calculations for a different um, ocean to atmosphere, pardon me, uh, mass ratio as compared to the result for no ocean. And again, here we're going back to plotting this as a function of ground velocity. And so what you can see is their conclusion was if you have a thin atmosphere or an or a atmosphere that is a low mass compared to your ocean, the ocean can very significantly by its presence actually increase the amount of atmospheric loss. And that is due to something, uh, uh, that's due to the uh, impedance of water relative to rock. And we can go into the technicalities of that um, in questions if people want to. Um, and so what we wanted to do is uh, they had explored uh, these sort of six candidate um, uh, sort of ocean to atmosphere uh, loss ratios, and they'd considered hydrogen atmospheres. And we, so we wanted to, uh, A, repeat their calculations with uh, improved um, equations of state that have become available since 2005, um, but also to uh, explore a wider range of composition. And so what we find is if we just look at a single um, ground velocity as a function of the atmosphere to ocean mass ratio, so this is what's on the x-axis, 
This is the, the loss fraction. So here one is total atmospheric loss. And I've chosen this um, transit uh, specifically because it's where the first, uh, where the most efficient loss uh, uh, versions start to actually hit total atmospheric loss. But what you see is that there's sort of two end member modes. So one over here is where you have uh, the most efficient loss for uh, uh, sort of low mass atmospheres compared to the oceans. And then you have another end member case where the ocean is a sort of um, comparable or smaller mass than the atmosphere, where actually this, this loss efficiency is equivalent to having no ocean at all. And there is quite a, you know, in, in physicist, astrophysicist terms, quite a rapid transition over about uh, one and a half to two orders of magnitude in the ratio of atmosphere to ocean loss, where you transition between these two regimes. And that means you're very sensitive to what the surface reservoir of um, uh, volatiles is at any particular time, its thermal state and its oxidation state as to how uh, thick your ocean is relative to your atmosphere. And to give you an indication, if we were to get smacked by something today, we are very much in the efficient loss regime. So bye-bye atmosphere. <laughs> um, whereas uh, if you were to sort of do that theoretical exercise we love to do as planetary scientists and take the sort of the carbonate um, uh, rocks on the earth and vaporize them and add about 200 to 300 bars of atmosphere, uh, the ancient earth using that approximation would be somewhere in the middle of the transition. And so if earth has experienced atmospheric loss, it probably started off in the low efficiency regime and has been getting uh, more and more efficient uh, if it went through uh, multiple events. Now we also have to return back to our problem that what uh, the ground is doing is dependent on what's on top of it. And if we, sorry, just to give you a reference, this is the this is the optimum, this is the maximum loss in the no uh, ocean case. And we can plot contours of loss um, as we vary our atmosphere to ocean mass ratio. And what you can see is that atmosphere, uh, the presence of an ocean can significantly increase loss. So for example, at the extreme here, you can have either 100% loss uh, if, you have a thin, if you have a thick ocean or 20% loss if you have no ocean at all. And basically none if you have a, a thin ocean compared to your atmosphere. But at the opposite extreme, oceans can actually protect your atmosphere because you can go from sort of uh, a situation where you would lose all your atmosphere, uh, um, give it, in that column at least, to giving you something that's only losing about 50%. And so there's this really interesting effect that it's not as straightforward as that if you condense an ocean, you've condemned your atmosphere uh, to loss, but actually it can go both ways. And there's actually a really interesting positive feedback where if you, have multiple impacts, you preferentially lose atmosphere to ocean, you actually push yourself towards a regime where your next impact is more likely to blow off uh, atmosphere. And so the next step we're going to do with this that somebody I don't have results to show you today is to take that same approach and convolve our uh, results with the output of 3D impact simulations to actually look at how this how this affects things uh, when you actually integrate these calculations across the entire surface surface of a body. So stay tuned for, for paper two. <laughs> um, but really the upshot of this that I sort of wanted to be the sort of the take home, and I think the point of start of discussion for, for this really interdisciplinary group is that I hope I've convinced you that what is what's going on in terms of your losing your atmosphere, both by larger and probably also by smaller impacts as well, is dependent on what your surface conditions are. It depends on where the volatiles are, how they're, as in how they're partitioned between different reservoirs, what's your oxidation state, what's your thermal state. Um, and that's a really interesting, very highly coupled problem that we need to track through accretion that we can't just take, you know, a scaling law 
that we can give you for the relationship between the impact parameters and loss and apply that straightforwardly to your uh, to a like an embodied model of accretion that actually we need to consider what's happening on the planet at the same time. And so the questions I, I have here are sort of how do we actually do that? How do we explore that without having so many parameters that it becomes an impossible, you get what you put in type situation? Um, so before we move to discussion, I just wanted to quickly summarize what I said, which is that giant impacts are really a significant can be a really significant driver of loss uh, of the volatiles through accretion. And the efficiency of that loss is dependent both on the impact parameters, but also on the surface environment that exists on the planets that are colliding at the point of impact. Um, if there's no ocean, the uh, lighter, the hotter, the lower pressure atmosphere, the more likely it is to be lost. Um, whereas in the presence of an ocean, um, that ocean can either accelerate or actually inhibit loss. And one thing I forgot to say is that uh, ocean don't care in terms of your atmospheric uh, uh, composition or pressure. Apart, uh, it's sort of relatively invariant to those things, um, apart from in terms of the mass of the atmosphere. And really the point I want to drive home is that in order to track volatile evolution through accretion, we really need to work together um, and try and build models that incorporate uh, all of the different processes that are governing uh, where volatiles are during accretion. Um, so thank you. Thank you, Simon, for a really, really exciting talk about giant impacts and their effects on volatile loss. Super. Um, so I'd like to open the floor now to any kind of questions or kind of discussion points um, in a kind of plenum discussion before we move on to the breakout rooms. Um, has anyone got something to get started either by raising your hand or by putting a comment in the chat? Um, otherwise, I'm going to start off by asking kind of Simon. OK, Tim's got a question. Go for it. Yeah, hi. Thank you so, so much for the, for the great talk. Um, I'll start off uh, with the, so I, it's really a technical question, uh, or actually two. So first of all, can you, sorry, I didn't get it actually. Can you re-explain why the ocean would actually protect from atmospheric loss? Uh, this is the first one. And the second one is when you, um, so in these impact simulations, right? You have your sort of box around, around your simulation. Uh, I think in the natural system, the planet is in a sort of orbit and you eject something. Um, but where's the point? How do you track the point actually where the volatiles that get lost cannot be re-accreted uh, at, at the next orbit? So these are just two technical points I wanted to uh, ask. Yeah, okay. So I'll start with the easy one first, uh, which is uh, in terms of re-accretion, um, it depends a little bit on how the volatiles are accreted. If they are accreted, dissolved, so not in the atmosphere, dissolved in... Uh, um, sort of larger bodies, they have a higher chance of being re-accreted on subsequent orbits. But if they're rejected, um, they're likely uh, forming basically ice crystals uh, in or remaining as vapor. And that sort of material can be really uh, efficiently lost by uh, radiation pressure from the sun. And so the chances are that although some of it might be re-accreted, the majority of what you blow off is probably uh, lost. Um, and that actually increasingly is probably the case also for a lot of the silicate material because it's being vaporized. And that also is sort of forming droplets and crystals that are quite efficiently um, blown out of the system. So you're probably likely not accreting a large fraction of what you, what you lose. So in order to explain the second one, you are forcing me to use bonus slide. <laughs> um, and, uh, uh, and and uh, force you to endure shock physics. Um, so, uh, apologies, I haven't, I didn't build this up nicely to explain it. So, um, bear with me. But what this is is a uh, the pressure in the material as a function of the particle velocity in a shock. And what the solid lines are showing are the Hugonios. So these are the points in phase space that you reach by shocks. So uh, for example, I've got three different points here. If you were to, to hit rock, which is this black line, so this is a force to right, uh, sort of you know, simulant for the ground. If you were to hit it 
uh, with a shot that has a particle velocity of one kilometer per second, it um, uh, ends up um, sort of uh, here. If it's three, five, and you sort of end up going up this curve to higher and higher pressure. Now, once I've shot this material up and it reaches the surface, um, it starts to decompress. And it by decompressing, it is shocking the materials that are um, sort of uh, above it. And so, for example, here you have this, uh, this blue curve is the water. So the rock reaches the rock water interface. It releases to the point where it has shocked the water to the same pressure as itself. And then it's then supporting and driving a shock uh, through through the water. Now, when the water reaches the atmosphere, it also releases. And so it follows its release curve down to um, a uh, down to the uh, pressure on the Hugonio for the atmosphere. So uh, these are two different atmospheres. This yellow one is a one bar atmosphere. This green raw bar is a 50 bar atmosphere. So what the reason that ocean can protect the um, the uh, sort of protect the atmosphere is that when the relations that we have modeled are a relation between the ground velocity and the um, uh, and the uh, yeah, so we, we're more, we're basically we our input to our simulation is the ground velocity, and so when you have a a, a simulation without a um, without an ocean, the velocity that we are simulating is the point where this release curve intersects the Hugonio for the atmosphere. So the the velocity that we're driving with is is here for this. So for this particular shock. Um, the particle velocity, the ground velocity we're driving it with is six kilometers a second, even though the, sh the particle velocity in the shock was three. Now, for a, um, uh, if we are modeling a simulation where there is an ocean present, the, the velocity we're modeling is where the rock intersects the ocean. So we're actually for a three um, kilometer in the shock, uh, three kilometer per second particle velocity in the shock, you actually only have what, like four and a half kilometers a second ground velocity. So you've gone from a six kilometer ground velocity to a four and a half kilometer ground velocity. Now, in cases where the ocean is thin relative to the atmosphere, you end up with reverberations inside the ocean. And so the ocean surface ends up traveling at the same velocity as the ground. And so the, the velocity that's driving loss in the atmosphere is this velocity here. Whereas if there was no ocean present, the velocity you'd actually be driving it with is higher. It's down here, it's the point on the, on the ideal gas hugon. And so the efficiency of loss is actually lower because you're driving it with a lower velocity. And that, that um, is just an interesting uh, aspect of where of how the, uh, of when you have a lower mass ocean, there is time for uh, release waves to travel across the ocean to make it the same speed as the ground, which is then lower than it would be if the ocean wasn't there at all. Does that Thank make sense? Thank you, Simon, for that. That's, that's a very detailed answer. Well, then, to shock physics. So I'm sorry if, if not, but I'm happy to. Cool. Uh, We've got another question from Matthias who um, said that you mentioned that planetary collisions can be very bright. Do you don't know if detecting a photometric peak associated with a collision would be feasible? Uh, ask Amy and I in uh, you know about a year. Uh, we actually have a, a master student who's going to be looking uh, uh, exactly at this at this uh, question. So we're going to try and uh, model some some large sort of super Earth simulations and see um, what the peak uh, luminosity would look like and how it would evolve over time and see whether we'd actually be able to pick that up in in uh, observations. But um, yeah, yeah, thank you, um, Tiffany Barry. Do you want to answer your ask your question yourself? Be there. Yeah, sure. Can you hear me? 
I can yep. hear you, yeah. Oh, great talk, Simon. That was really interesting. Yeah, it's just a really trivial question, but I was just wondering if you know what um, the minimum size of a bolide would be that would create the sort of ground kick effect on the, the opposite side to the impact. I don't off the top of my head. Um, I believe uh, in there's a paper by Hilke Schlichting in 2015 who looked at like uh, the transition between smaller in sort of a sort of idealized way between smaller and larger impacts and looked at the efficiency of loss uh, as a function of the size of the body. So I think um, I think she looked at, uh, at that uh, that transition. Um, now there's there's sort of idealistic um, assumptions that go into that that calculation, but that would probably give you an idea of of where that transition is. Okay, thanks. No worries. Um, so I think there's another question from um, is it Samson John Johnson? Yes. Hi. Thank you. Um, this is sort of following up on Tim's first question about uh, reaccretion. But did you? Uh, maybe I'm not remember enough about radiation pressure, but does it matter about host type? Like if you, you throw this around M dwarf, uh, is that really gonna impact the efficiency of reaccretion? Or there's slash the other question is push the star or push the planet into a larger orbit. Um, would that leave some sort of observational signature of like, oh, this went through a you know big impact, but still has more atmosphere than you'd expect sort of thing? Uh, interesting question. I haven't run the, the math. So, um, the orbital location is, is definitely going to matter because, um, you basically what is happening is over time, your, when you first eject material, your it's all on roughly on orbits that intersect the orbit of the, of the primary, right? So you've all, mm -hmm. you've, you've chucked out a load of material and everything's on the same orbit, but just with different eccentricities and, um, inclinations. And so what basically is the thing is that you want to have as many uh, orbits so that all of that material can cross paths with the the, the uh, sort of post-impact body as many times as possible to reaccrete all of that material. And so I naively, and I would have to, to think about this more, would say that the closer you in are in, that effect would promote reaccretion. But obviously you've got this counteracting effect where closer in you have uh, the higher radiation pressure uh, and blowing it out. And also you have that variation with stellar type. So I think you would actually have to do the math and calculate that, that balance. I haven't uh, uh, done that. There's some work on debris disks that Amy and, and Mark might be a bit more familiar with in terms of uh, blowing out that um, material from, from debris disks and, and lifetime of, of particularly um, initially highly vaporized every disk, which would be sort of equivalent, but I don't know. Um, I don't know that literature well enough to, to make an informed comment. Cool. Well, let's um, open the floor to Mark. Awesome. Very, Thank you. Um, very briefly for one quick awesome. question before we move to the brief crowd groups. If we can keep the response quite short, Simon. Yeah. <clears throat> well, I, I wanted to actually follow up. It was sort of the same uh, uh, point um, because ra radiation pressure acts, well, isn't going to be dependent on on distance from the star, but it'll depend on the size of the dust. And my, my understanding was that the silicate dust that comes off the moon forming impact all is all formed at about millimeter size, in which case it's not, it doesn't get removed by radiation pressure, and it'll all get, well, in, in it, you just follow the dynamics, then about 50% of it ends up on the Earth and 50% ends up on the on Venus. Um, so, so I guess the, the question is. Is, is there so, something different that happens for all the volatile dust? What, what size does it get, uh, does it condense at? So again, I haven't done that um, sort of the equivalent calculation, but you are starting off at, at lower density. You have a lower um, um, sort of condensation threshold. So for some of these things, they wouldn't actually be, um, uh, they wouldn't solidify, they'd remain in the gas phase, uh, right? They're not They're not going to solidify at the, at the well, depending on where you are relative to the sun. Um, but I don't know. I would suspect they, given the dependencies, I suspect they'd form smaller crystals, but exactly the the size I would have to actually run through the the, the calculation. Sorry. <laughs> it's a very unsatisfactory actor. 
Cool. Well, thank you, Simon. Thank you for the discussion. It's been really, really interesting. Um, so we've got 10 minutes left at the end. And what we did last time was to split everyone to kind of small breakout groups to have a chance to kind of continue discussing these topics and various other topics. So if anyone doesn't want to um, be part of the breakout sessions, would you mind leaving the meeting now? And then I will um, ask Zoom to randomly allocate you to these breakout sessions. Um, and um, when you get there, maybe you can all introduce yourselves um, to start with. And, um, and then you can kind of continue the um, discussion. Oh no, everyone's going three breakout rooms. Uh, yeah, I think you 